It's January 17, 2009. This is Maximize Utility. All my life I fantasized about being a hero. And usually it would be a sports fantasy. Let me tell you one of them. I'm playing right field at Fenway Park. A ball is hit deep, deep right. I run out. I catch the ball. But wait, there's more. There's a runner on third base. I'm in deep, deep right. No man could reach the plate. But with my cannon arm, but I throw the ball to the plate, throwing a direct strike, and throwing the runner out. And I save the game. I trot off the field, oblivious to the cheers of the crowd, so I'm just doing my job. Anyway, that's a fantasy I've had many, many times. And I bring it up because I want to talk about the macro economy and all the things we're doing today to fix it, to save it. And I think it's all about people who think they are heroes, who fantasize about thinking they can save the macro economy. I don't think it's something we can save. I don't really think there is a macro economy. And it's all about a phony, phony macroeconomics, about our ability to do policy, fiscal policy, monetary policy, to save an economy from a recession. Just to clue you in, in case you didn't notice, we're doing fiscal policy on an order of almost a trillion dollars, something unlike we've ever done before in the history of this country, running deficits unlike we've ever had before, or at least since World War II. And we're also doing monetary policy unlike we've ever done before, again, in the trillions. And I think that that's all a phony thing. I don't think that the government can stabilize the economy. I think the government generally contributes to making the economy unstable. And I think it's all about the future. I think it's about the future in two different ways. I think it's about the intellectual future that maybe 20 years from now we'll look back and we'll say that what we were doing was really stupid. We didn't have any foundation for it. That's what I want to try to bring out today. And it's all about our children's future. We are doing policy and raising deficits and increasing debt for our country. It's going to have to be paid back and our children will have to pay it back. I'm going to try to summarize all the current prominent issues of the macroeconomy and the political economy, and including going back into time and looking at some of the intellectual history of macroeconomics. Now, this is a ridiculously ambitious thing to try to do, so I have to do it in bullet point format. So what I'll say I'm going to do is I'm going to do a reductio ad absurdum, which is basically bullet points with an intellectual point behind it. And my gig is, or what, why should you listen to me? What is my innovation? Well, I'm willing to muck it up for one thing. I'm willing to say that people don't know what they're doing. I'm not going to be pious about it at all. And I know the textbooks. I know what Ben Bernanke supposedly knows. Now, you might be averse to criticize a Ben Bernanke or a Hank Paulson because you think they rely on some staff of economists who know all sorts of things about what's true about macroeconomics. I contend that I reasonably know that. And one more thing, I'm going to offer an alternative. I'm going to offer what I call a maximized utility solution to our current recession problem. It's a microeconomic solution, and I think it is a legitimate solution. I think it vastly outclasses all this macroeconomic stuff we're trying to do. To recap, our economy grows every year, maybe about 3% on average, except for certain periods when it stops growing or goes into negative growth, actually contracts. We had uh, such periods, I call them recessions, in 1982 and then in 1990-91, and in uh, 2001. In 1991, it spanned, I think, July through February. And now we're in a recession in 2008. It's actually been backdated to December 2007. So this current recession is longer than either of the last two recessions. It's also more severe. It's so bad, relatively speaking, compared to 2001, that maybe we should not designate 2001 as a recession any longer. Anyway, the idea is that when we get to these bad periods, the government can, with either fiscal policy or monetary policy, uh, put some money, put some economic activity out there, stimulate the economy. That's what we're doing today, and we're doing it in a very, very big way. And the idea is to get back on our GDP growth trend of about 3%. And that's very, very important, and we think, or some people think, that we can get stuck in an under-equilibrium where the economy doesn't recover, even though the resources are there for economic growth. That's where we are today, and that's why we're doing all this policy. Some more basics of macro. We have monetary policy and fiscal policy, and the odd thing is we're doing fiscal policy now in a really, really big way. It's odd because we had abandoned fiscal policy as a tool to shape the economy. Fiscal policy is the spending of funds by the government and the setting of tax rates by the government, cutting taxes, for example, to stimulate the economy, or doing more government spending to stimulate the economy. The reason we abandoned it is that it didn't work. We couldn't target things. In particular, it had timing problems. 
that we wouldn't even be able to get the policy out there quickly enough. And then by the time it started to take effect, the economy would recover. So for the last 20 or so years, we did almost exclusively monetary policy. But the reason we decided to do fiscal policy this time is quite simple. The monetary policy didn't work. Our traditional monetary policy of setting the Fed Fund's target rate and hoping that by lowering that rate, that that rate would bubble forward to the rest of the economy and would stimulate the economy, it just didn't work. So we tried doing other Fed policy, in particular big lending facilities, and that seems to have not worked too well either. So now we decided that we have to use fiscal policy. And we're really calling on the case of Japan. Now the Japanese economy was growing at a good 4% or something like that for a long, long time. And around 1990, it stopped growing. And then for a long, long period of time, about a decade, it hardly grew at all. Now, some people say that the Japanese simply didn't do good policy. If they had gun fiscal policy and monetary policy, their economy would have grown more. I think that is a gross, gross fallacy. I think the Japanese economy grew about as much as it was ever going to grow, and it had nothing to do with policy. In fact, the Japanese did do extensive monetary policy and fiscal policy, and it didn't work. What was really happening is that the real underlying economy in Japan just didn't have any growth in it. It had nothing to do with policy. So 2008 would be a true anus horribilis. The, we'd be in a recession throughout the entire year, and uh, the stock market would go down a lot. S&P would be down about 37%. Housing prices would go down. It was a pretty bad year economically. But coming into 2008, that wasn't clear. In 2007, uh, it looked okay. The emphasis was still on fighting inflation. Ben Bernanke was still pretty much an inflation fighter would only be in 2008 that we would uh, start to fight a recession. Even halfway through 2008, we were still thinking the economy was okay. I have many clips I could show them to you, and you'd see that most people were saying we would not get a recession or a deep recession. True, people were saying we would get, we would get a recession, but people are always saying that. Every year, there's so many forecasters who say this will be the year of recession. That's the way it was in 2007, 2006, 2005, you name it. Let's start with tax cuts. That's a basic piece of fiscal policy. And in 2008, we did a tax cut stimulus. It was about $100 billion worth. I'm purposely vague about the exact numbers and dates and so on, because it would take too long to explain all that. But the question is, what was the effect of the tax cut? Did it stimulate the economy? Well, how do economists even know the effects? Well, they can survey the intentions of consumers, and then they can survey what their actions were. But the surveys are hard to pin down. Then we can look in the national income accounts and or related series like retail spending and see if we can see the blips. And you can see a little bit of a blip in GDP and retail spending perhaps in the second quarter of 08 and the third quarter of 08. What it did to help the economy stay out of a recession, it's very, very hard to say. But the story about tax cuts is there's really two basic theories. Uh, basic Keynesian theory says that if you give people money, they'll spend it according to their MPC, their marginal propensity to consume. Maybe it's about 80%. And another uh, theory is, you might call it the permanent income theory, says that if you give people some money and they think it's a one-time shot, they'll just add it to their long-run income. You might call this uh, Milton Friedman's story. You might call it a microeconomic story. And then they'll spend some bit of that, maybe about the interest amount of it, maybe 5%. Now, in the real world out there, you can probably feel pretty sure that maybe a third of the people in this country pretty much didn't touch that money at all. They just banked it. Maybe another third put some of it to their credit card debt and put some aside because they didn't really want to spend at the moment. And then maybe another third did indeed spend it. If they spent it, they went down to Walmart and Kmart and Target and so on and bought stuff. A lot of it would have been imported from China. That would have uh, detracted from GDP. Imports uh, take out of GDP. Anyway, the effects of the tax cut, it's not so much what was it. Why don't we study it some more and more and more and find out how to do it better, who to target to get people to spend. It's a question of why do it. Why did we even do it? Did anybody seriously think it was going to have a real significant effect? Now we're trying harder to find ways to make it work better. Again, target the people who actually spend it. But didn't we get in trouble from too much spending in the first place? Some people have kooky solutions and say, well, let's give coupons to people so that people will spend those coupons because they won't be able to keep it as money. The coupons will expire or something like that. Other people say, don't give people tax cuts, but lower the sales tax rate so that people go to stores and they see things that are cheaper. But why are we even trying this? Why are we even trying to get people to spend it? That's the question.